Our scripture this reading is a little unusual in that it comes from two different parts of the Bible. And I had to put it together and then I realized that it's very appropriate. The first the text is from Exodus 20 verse 5. Take a minute to turn there, Exodus 20 verse 5. We're familiar with Exodus 20. Certainly uh, we repeat a section of that every, every week. Exodus 20 verse 5, and I thought I should read more, but I think I won't. I just will read just what I was instructed to read here. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. And of course we're talking about the second commandment here. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And then we turn to Ezekiel 18, verse 19 and 20. Ezekiel 18, verses 19 and 20 is a complement to what we just read in Exodus. Yet say ye, why doth the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Good morning. <laughs> Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for your loving kindness to us, your righteousness, and we just uh, ask for your promise of the Holy Spirit to guide us into your word, to draw us closer to yourself, to understand things more deeply, that will help us to have the very perceptions of Jesus. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go and turn back to Exodus chapter 20. I don't know uh, the things that you thought when you first read Exodus chapter 20, the second commandment, where it seems like God would, it says here, uh, visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Well, let's go ahead and read the whole commandment. Uh, the title of this sermon is Disposition uh, versus uh, Destiny, right? You know, are we predisposed, a predisposition to, um, to be lost or that we're victims of our biology, of our, uh, our hereditary traits? Or is it our choice? Do our choices make the difference? Well, let's go ahead and read the second commandment here, beginning with verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, and a, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. And then also in the book of... Numbers. Let's turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verse 18, which is going to say exactly the same thing. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 18. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. And it, and it just happens that most people follow the same inclinations and decision making as their parents or their grandparents, okay? Generally follow the same line, but as we find out, we're not punished for the sins of our parents. We may be predisposed to certain behaviors because they pass these hereditary traits on to us. We could be more inclined to drink alcohol or have a, a temper. But we don't have to give in to it. And that will be our course of our study this morning. But let's just turn to Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16. 
we may receive inclinations, be predisposed to certain behaviors because of our parents and grandparents and great grandparents. But in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, the father shall not be put to death for the children, uh, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for what? For his own sins. Okay, all right. And, and we'll go back to Ezekiel, which we read earlier, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. And, and for many people, that sounds like a contradiction. How do we, God, seems like we're punished up to the third, fourth generation. But that would only be as we share in those iniquities, right? Okay. And again, Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. Yet say ye, why doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and keepeth all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So there is simply individual accountability, but essentially what God's saying under the second commandment, there's such a strong pull in our heredity, in our genes, a predisposition to act a certain way or to behave a certain way. Okay, But we do have a choice. We do have a choice. So we were all born with certain hereditary tendencies or certain inclinations. These inherited genes can become a quick dis predisposition to a quick temper or to drink alcohol. But these genes do not produce the problem. We create the problem by our choices. Uh, a doctor had said years ago, uh, heredity loads the gun, but our choices pull the trigger. Okay? We can experience a strong pull from these inclinations, but it's when we send them a signal. When we send them a signal. For example, let's say that I had a predisposition to drink alcohol. Okay, say that was passed down through hereditary traits. But it's not like I would have a strong urge to drink alcohol all day long. Something would trigger the desire. And if you allow that trigger to happen, then the pull, that hereditary pull is strong, isn't it? Because something literally was passed on to you. Okay? So our genes or inclinations they all have potential. They all have potential, but they have to be activated to release that potential. We don't want to activate them. Here's a, a good example they did, and uh, of course they're always doing it on mice, aren't they? And so these mice had the agouti gene, agouti gene. And this gene would cause these mice, mice to be fat and to have yellow coats. It would also raise their risk of cancer and diabetes. So in this experiment, just before conception, the agouti, mother mouse, would be fed a nutritional chemical called a methyl group in the form of a B vitamin. The result was that the offspring of this group did not become fat or yellow. So here was an external, so there was a gene that would have made them fat and made them yellow, but by this external signal, they didn't become fat or yellow. So we know that just because something is predisposed to be a certain way, it doesn't have to happen that way. There can be an external influence that can now change. You're not a slave to your genetics. You're not a slave to your inherit inherited tendencies. But you can actually wind up creating a new disposition to pass on, right? Say you are genetically, and this is how we could easily trigger or signal something. Let's say you are genetically disposi uh, uh, predisposed to depression. If you would simply say things like, 
My mother had depression, and that's why I have depression, and now my daughter suffers from depression. What is that? It's a negative, but it's more than a name. It's a signal. If I was actually passed on a gene that made me more likely and be predisposed to depression, just by me saying I have depression because my mom has depression makes it more likely for me to fall into depression. It's almost as if this has to be unzipped or I have to open it or activate it. But you can do that with your thoughts. That's how powerful our thoughts are. This is why we don't want any negativity. And if you're predisposed to something, don't just have a failed attitude and say, well, I was just born that way, I'll always be that way. Because the chances are then what? You will be that way. You will be that way. Um, there's something in, called... Uh, oh, so... so on these, these cells are what they call epigenetic marks. And if you activate them or send them a signal, then, then it will happen. So epigenetics, epi or genetics, you know, basically genetics as we understand it is things that we inherit. But epi means in addition to. So in addition to the normal traditional understanding that hereditary traits are passed on, other things can happen. Epigenetics. It doesn't have to be you're a slave to your genetics. There's other things that impress uh, a person's future. And biologists first observed this when they were dealing with plants. So if you added something to a rose, you didn't have to have a red rose. You could have what? You know, all kinds of roses, right? But it's still what? It's still a rose, though. And so you can, by doing something in addition to it, change it, but it will still be a rose. But so we're, we're human, but you can do something other than the traditional idea of inherited tendencies. Something could be added to, and it can come out differently. But you're still human. Okay? So let's... let's liken this to your life span as a very long movie. The cells would be the actors and the actresses. And they are obviously an essential part of this movie, this story of your life. DNA in turn would be the script. There's a script for your life when you're born. There's a genetic code. And the Script is the instructions for the participants of the movie to perform their certain roles. And the actual words to the script is that DNA sequence of the, the specific things that they're going to say and the specific things that they're going to do in the story. But what epigenetics says is that it becomes the director. And you can change the script. You could change the words that a certain player is going to say. This player can now become, instead of a, a bad player, can actually be a good player in the script. He doesn't do these things anymore, he does other things. And so your life has been given a script when you were born, but by your choices and the things you study and the things you listen to, you're changing the story. There may be an inclination to the story, but, and that inclination may be a very bad story, may be inclined to be a story that would end up very bad. But something in addition to, added to the story, could change the whole plot. And the story becomes a very good story. And so you make up your own story. You know, you have a script. But it's what you read and listen to and the choices you make that rewrites that story. And this is why in our script of life, we don't want to say things like, I can't do this. 
Because if you say, oh, I can't do that, you probably won't. If you have words of doubt, oh, this will never turn out good. Or this is too hard. Or I don't want to. You are influencing the script of your story and emphasizing it to actually come out that way. And you're writing this script every day. But this script can go either way. You could add negative thoughts to the script or positive thoughts. A story that maybe didn't include Jesus to a story that makes Jesus the most important person in your life. So the sins of our parents created a predisposition. It created an original script. But as we just explained, that's not your destiny. It's just a beginning. The beginning of a story. Um, there's, in addition to our choices, these epigenetic signals, what you choose to think about or what you choose to eat, alter the expression of genes. Puts little, what they call epigenetic markers on them which can be passed on to our children, actually. So you're actually writing a script that could be passed on to your children, and that's the beginning of their story. But they'll be accountable for their own choices. The seahorse-shaped structure in the middle of the brain called the hippocampus processes incoming information, facilitates the conversion of short-term memory to long-term memory, and helps control our stress response. So, scientists have found that in a loving and nurturing environment, acetyl epigenetic markers increase on the genes in the hippocampus that keeps us calm and peaceful. The more acetyl markers, the more these peace genes in the hippocampus express and dampen the stress response. A toxic choice produces the opposite effect. The acetyl markers reduce and the methyl markers increase, causing us to have less peace. It's your choice. On your genes, you have markers, but you can rewrite your script via positivity, negativity, and change the markers. And that will determine how much peace you have in life. It determines a lot of things. But the principle would be, whatever you think the most, that's what actually is going to grow. We think the most will grow. So let's say again you're inclined to depression, and you have actually become depressed. What do you do? The inclination, what you are predisposed to, has already been triggered. It's already become part of your story. It's already become part of your experience. Well, what you want to do is you want the firing of those neurons that are tending towards the depression to fire not simultaneously but apart. You want them not to be connected anymore but now disconnected. In other words, you want to divide them and conquer them. But there's two things you'll need to do. Number one, Replace the negativity with positivity. And when I talk about positivity, I'm talking about spiritual things, things that are good. Philippians 4 8, whatever is good and of good report. Think about these kinds of things. So the first thing is to stop, by God's grace, stop giving signals that trigger the negative, that trigger these things that keep maintaining their connection and be able to fire together and become stronger and stronger and more likely. And the second thing is to actually not just stop the negativity, but do what? The positivity. Because the positivity is going to secrete all different kinds of different chemicals. Like what we talked about last Sabbath, oxytocin. It's going to secrete things like dopamine and serotonin. Because the positivity is associated with these chemicals that not only bring healing to your body, but actually destroy the depression 
uh, inclination. So the oxytocin bonds and remolds chemicals. Dopamine increases focus and attention, and serotonin increases feelings of peace and happiness. So this all helps to disconnect and desynchronize the neurons that are associated with depression. If they stop firing together, they will no longer fire together. This leads to wiping out or popping these negative con or connections and rebuilding new positive ones. So one of the first things we have to do is don't provide a signal to activate these things. Produce the opposite signal of positivity and they will ultimately bring the negative epigenetic marks and they'll begin to actually fade. This is just physiologically, they begin to fade. Now there's something I thought was very interesting and we'll want to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 as we, we think about writing our script. Writing the script, not living by the script handed to us because the script handed to us, we were all born with what kind of nature? A fallen nature. And if we just follow that script and nothing changes, we're not going to make it to heaven. Something will have to happen to the script we've been handed. Would you agree? Okay. But there's a, a term here called integrative functional organization, which means that the brain was designed to work all its parts working together. But we know that when there's disturbances, when there's parts of the brain that overwork and other parts of the brains that are underworking, it causes disturbances, it causes mental illness. Okay? All kinds of different problems. So we, we want the brain to work harmoniously together. And one of the things that helps it to work together is for all parts to be working. Okay? So when we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, it gives us this principle. It says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so when you start thinking about this, to me, I, I always looked at this verse simply from a, an evangelistic viewpoint, where we're all supposed to be doing something. But now I'm looking at it from my mental health perspective and I'm saying, oh, this makes perfect sense that the brain, everything needs to be working and this is how I truly can experience love in a much fuller, fuller way. Okay? That every part needs to be doing its function. Um, so this would mean that somehow the non-conscious part of the brain is working with the conscious part. And there's all kinds of parts to the brain. So much of what we consciously think and what we do and say is driven by the information and the activity in the non-conscious mind. And the non-conscious mind is it's our memories. It's this massive memory account, right? Bank account, where it has our experiences. And that really is changing all the time as we get more and more information. Uh, now, they say for the brain to work harmoniously together, we have to experience deep and last to experience deep and lasting change. The brain itself needs to work work together, and what makes it better to work together is when we have deep contemplative thinking. If all our thinking is shallow the brain as a whole will not work harmoniously together. Because the brain was actually designed that we would have a period of time every day where we'd be in deep contemplative thinking. Now when I, and I'm trying to use those words very carefully because in the New Age movement they just talk about, you know, you know meditation, empty your mind. But that's not really what's going to bring the mind in harmoniously working together. And I would even call this, and I'm going to start working on something on, on sanctuary thinking, 
is that Sabbath rest thinking. I want you to think about what the Sabbath means to us is when we do not think about what? Our secular things. We have the perfect opportunity to find significant time to deeply think about spiritual things. In a much deeper way and a greater opportunity that maybe we have during the week. But this is part of what's going to help us have a more harmonious functioning brain where we'll be able to experience love in a fuller way. Because imagine if your brain is just being scattered, all these scattering thoughts. It's not fully functioning. And we're never going to experience love like we could. To experience this love, we need to deeper contemplative contemplation of, of God's goodness and so forth. Now, they, they've actually done research that shows that the, there's a greater increase in gamma waves and there's a greater uh, increase of attention and memory building and learning when we are thinking about positive things in a restive, contemplative state. So just to take time and be still. God says, and know that I am God. And the longer you take just to commune with God and to contemplate His Word, and the beauty of the truths that you're studying, you bring healing to your brain. All the benefits that come with it. Now I want us to turn to Hebrews. Because means when I you know, of course, immediately I'm thinking of Hebrews chapter 4, the idea of Sabbath rest, and how God's people, even after they had occupied Canaan, he says, You still haven't entered my rest. Because entering God's rest has nothing to do with geography. Entering God's rest really has, doesn't have anything to do with sleep. Well, that doesn't leave many other options. Well, if God's Sabbath rest and the rest in Jesus Christ doesn't have anything to do with geography or sleeping, then what's it have to do with? It has to do with the quality of your thoughts. The quality of your thinking. So as we read through verses 1 through 13, I want you to think in terms of what do these verses tell us? This isn't necessarily a Bible study on which day is the Sabbath. This is really more of a Bible study. What does it really mean to have Sabbath rest thinking? To have contemplative, restive thinking in God that helps heal the brain, gives you a better sense of peace, a greater opportunity to have better memory, and so forth. So let's look at these verses. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left of entering into his rest. Right? Any of you should seem to come short of it. So who's he speaking to, first of all? Christian community, isn't he? I mean, this is Paul writing the book of Hebrews. So he's talking about how it's possible that Christians themselves could fall short of actually experiencing this rest. Okay? Let's read on, verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with what? Faith in them that heard it. So when we go back to the Eve story and she started having doubt, she lost a certain mental strength, didn't she? But what's going to give you mental strength is somehow this restive, Sabbath thinking of resting in God and having faith in God, believing in God. But you know, just think about this. If you doubt God's love, we're going to lose out on that contemplative rest. It will affect our overall thinking capacity. So having a daily devotional, having a time just between you and God, is going to bring you all the mental benefits of reasoning abilities and peace with God. Understanding, grappling with situations. You, when you face difficulties, you'll go through them better. 
But we have to have faith in God. Verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into the rest. So if you're believing, that's a mental thing in it, isn't it? So this mental thing of believing and having faith with God is what enables you to have this rest in Him. And so we have entered into that rest, as He said, As I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although thy works were finished from the foundation of the world. For He spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest from the seventh day from His works. So when we think of in relation to God resting, what did He just do? He just created the world how? Absolutely perfectly. You know, you can't separate true rest from obedience, from doing that which is good, that which is positive. It is the connection of faith in God, belief in God, doing that which is good, being doing those things that help recreate you in the image of Jesus Christ, which makes this contemplative rest truly healing and brings the mind back to operating harmoniously. Because think about it, if you take out any one of those elements, you don't have faith in God. You haven't been doing those things that are good, that helps recreate you in the image of Jesus Christ. How can you ever have a fully functioning, harmoniously, harmonious mind? It wouldn't be possible, would it? So all this stuff fits together. And then in verse 5, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in. And they, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of what? And that's again what destroyed, well, destroyed Lucifer's mind. He didn't believe anymore. Eve didn't believe anymore. For that moment. And it destroyed their peace. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in, and they whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. There's a little bit of new information in that verse. What is it? Okay, don't harden. Don't harden what you've heard, but hear his voice. You know, there's, there's something about this rest in Jesus Christ where you hear His voice as opposed to a prayer life where He only hears your voice. Is that a fair statement? That you are communing with God to bring harmony to your mind, that every part will function, and this is going to give you peace, but you can't separate it from this contemplative, restive, thinking upon, having faith in God, these moments with Him. As opposed to lay me down to sleep prayers. You're just short, short thoughts here and little thoughts there. Very shallow, 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 shallow. God gave us a mind to think deeply. To think hard. Okay? Verse 8. For if Jesus, and the word Jesus really should be Joshua there. If Joshua had given them rest you know, when they entered into Canaan, they would not have afterwards spoken of another day. So this is not a geography thing. The rest that God had promised Israel had nothing to do with them simply entering into the land. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did for me is. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man shall after the same example of unbelief. Now, this, it's going to end with what? Verse 12, the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So everything he had been talking about rest leads to this verse, doesn't it? That you need God's Word to show you where you're at and to be able to divide the good from the bad. And this happens when you're in deep communion time with God, which is going to bring harmony to your mind. It's going to help you think better, help you think clear. But you know what the devil's going to do? He's going to try to make sure that you're so busy that you just don't have time to commune with God. 
that you have no time to have deep thoughts. And one of the things that destroys having deep thoughts is television. It takes away our creativity. And we've got to be so ever careful because the devil is trying to destroy our ability to even think deeply, even about the Word of God. That means that everything we do affects the human mind, whether it's going to expand and understand spiritual things in a greater way, or we're shrinking that ability. So in Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am... Just be still. Don't, don't be so busy. Take the time. Find a time and a place to meet with God. Be still. It doesn't mean empty your mind. Think about God. Commune with God. Think deeply upon what you've learned today. What you've learned in your devotional time in reading God's Word. Think of what Jesus talked about in Matthew. or Yeah, Matthew. No, it's John 15. The vine and the branches. The vine and the branches. So if you think in terms of the Sabbath rest thinking or this, this time in which you are this, you have this special contemplative restive thinking and meditating upon God's Word. What are you doing when you do that? Think of the vine and the branches. When you're taking more time to think about how wonderful God is and you're thinking more deeply upon what He has said, you're making more connections to who? To Jesus Himself. You see, if our thoughts are just shower, they're just quick, and we don't spend time, we're not making the same connections to Jesus. Would you agree? And that's what we need. Our thinking can bring us and give us into more connections with Jesus. If your brain, with deeper, more contemplative thinking, there is more activity between the various parts of the brain, and as such, the brain, what's happening to the brain itself with this deeper thinking, is itself growing more branches and integrating and linking thoughts, which translates into increased intelligence and wisdom. There is more peace, and you have increased immunity, or you're increasingly immune and to, or you lessen cardiovascular disease, your risk. So even science knows on a physical scale that when you're involved in more deep contemplative thought, you're creating more branches in your brain. You're increasing your capacity of intelligence and wisdom. And what better way to contemplate and have deep thoughts than the deep thoughts of God and the goodness of God. I would even call something, this integrative functional organization, this idea of everything kind of working together, and maybe even think of it in terms of an altar of incense thinking. So you know, a lot of times when we look at the sanctuary, we look at each thing as an individual piece of furniture, which it is. But now look at them from an integrative way. That they're all to work together. Okay? So think of each one of these pieces of furniture, not just separate, but they're working together. Now, when you think of the altar of incense right here, this is a piece of furniture that brings you closest to the presence of God in the most holy place. Now, what ultimately brings you to that point of that closeness to God but the actually integrative thinking of everything you've learned in this process of salvation up to that point. So in this integrative thinking of altar of incense thinking, you are taking with you to draw closer into the presence of God what you've already experienced here and every day you're thanking God of the sacrifice that Jesus has made to make it possible for the healing of your mind to have that connection with God. It's all part of drawing closer. Because if I think as far as it's integrative, 
than everything that happened leading up to here. If I envision myself walking from here to here, I'm bringing my whole experience with me to here. And this is what's going to help me have that prayerful, contemplative, close communion with God. When I'm praying and I'm thinking of God and I'm thanking God of what He's already done for me, what Jesus did for me in dying on the cross, the great sacrifice made for me. And then you bring in that contemplative thinking the labor and how God wants to wash you. He wants to cleanse you. And yet your willingness to look into labor and see yourself as you really are. And you think of the things associated with washing like the Holy Spirit. The Word of God. And you're so thankful for God and you're contemplating the washing of regeneration by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit in your life as you're communing and drawing closer to God. And then you go from there and you're including integratively, you're thinking about menorah and how God has given you the opportunity to shine for Him. The many opportunities in your willingness. Use me today, Father, in your service. And you think about the showbread and how Jesus has made Himself available for us to, to devour, to eat His flesh. And, and in doing so, we become like Him. Day by day, eating, being nourished spiritually. Eating the bread of life, Jesus Christ, is all part of your communion, deep thinking with God. And the altar of incense itself, the whole idea of, of intercessory prayer. But intercessory prayer would be integrative. I want you to think about being integrative. That helps bring deep thinking that in your prayer life, in your interceding for people, bring your whole experience of thankfulness to God through the sanctuary, to that very part of the sanctuary that puts you right in the very presence of God. And I know we're just skimming the surface of talking about altar of incense thinking or praying. But I want us to start thinking about what this can mean in integrating these things in our life. What the things God has specifically done for you. But it gives us a blueprint of how to think. It gives us a blueprint of what could be brought into that time. That special time of thinking more deeply about God. They have something called uh, quantum Zeno effect. Q-Z-E. And... Uh, they say this means it's a repeated effort that takes that it allows us to learn better. When you when you take things and you you read you read them again, you do something with it. You read it, you write it, you think about it, and this re, and you keep repeating the process. You use what you've learned. And of course, this is going to help get it more deep seated in us, isn't it? But as you learn these things, you have a better understanding of them as you keep thinking about them because if we just read something and Jesus said love your enemies and I read it but I don't think about it again for another six months as opposed to I'm thinking about it Jesus said and now I'm gonna I wanna really pray about this I want this to be, I want to meditate upon this. I want to contemplate, love your enemies. So that's a different way of thinking about it, isn't it? And you're thinking about it. And you're writing about it. And you're talking about it. And you're praying about it. Well, that's a whole different way of experiencing that verse. And now it's become more a part of your non-conscious mind. This is now in you which will be drawn by your conscious mind when you are thinking, when you're aware of thinking. Because that's exactly where you want it. You don't want some little shallow seed. You don't want the seeds to be shallow. You want to take these seeds and you want to plant them deep in. And then repeating these thoughts and things like that, is going to help bring us to a point of what we, we would call second nature. Um, where these new thoughts have actually moved into your non-conscious mind. So that you're, you will be influenced by that as you make decisions through life. It's what you've added to your script. Think of it in terms of riding a bike. 
Do you remember the first day you tried to ride a bike? How well did you do? A little wobbly? It's a new experience. You, you don't have any learning. There's nothing in your mind. You've seen people do it. But until you get on that bike and you start feeling the pull and the balance and stuff, and you've got this wonderful mind that we can learn to ride the bike. But you go over it and over it and over it, and now all of a sudden you're riding that bike without even thinking about it. See, this is what you want to happen with things that are more spiritual. You're thinking about it, doing it, thinking about it, doing it, praying about it. Kind of like riding a bike. And the only time you're going to have to probably wind up consciously thinking about riding a bike is when you start doing mountain biking, right? Now, I had mentioned earlier that up to 99% of the decisions you make are based on what you have built and put in your non-conscious cognitive part of your brain. Then that might even sound like, oh, well, I'm just carrying out like I'm a slave to it. Well, no, no, you're not a slave to it. It's just that your mind is working all the time. 24-7, the non-conscious mind is working. But here's the thing. When you and I add new information, when we add scenes to the script of our life, positive ones, thoughts about Jesus, things Jesus said, things that weren't on that original script of our life, probably didn't even include Jesus. But now you know Jesus in the script of your life, you want to say, oh, I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about Him over and over. And now that's actually part of your memory, isn't it? So when you study spiritual things, you're not just adding information. You're redesigning your memory. Does that make sense? So you're redesigning your memory. God wants you to study truth so that He can reorganize your thoughts. If you and I don't study our Bibles, and we don't allow God to use us in His service, it's really hard for Him to reorganize our thoughts to think as Jesus thinks. But when you place yourselves in the school of Christ, and you commune with God with this deep contemplative thinking. And you study the Bible and you allow God to use you in service and meeting people. Well, you're not just adding an experience and information to this mind. You are actually redesigning your memory. You've added to the story and now the story is essentially different. Now the reason this becomes important because this is your worldview. And your worldview can change. The Apostle Paul had a world view as he looked at Christians and his whole world view changed when he met Jesus. He had a script that said, kill the members of the church. And then his script got rewrote, which says, Jesus loves you. I want, God wants to use me in his service. And now the script of his life completely changed. But he didn't just add information about Jesus. It redesigned his whole memory. And this unconscious part of his mind. Which is what we're acting out of. I mean, essentially, if you say something like the color red. Well, I have in my mind, in memory, how I react to the color red. Or how I react to certain situations. Or certain, you know, certain people. It's already there. And what I'm likely going to do is react basically on how I've already reacted. But what if I've looked at someone the wrong way? And Jesus says, love your enemies. And now I begin to pray and I say, Father, I want to love this person. I just changed the script. I didn't just add a thought about this person. I start remaking my script. I start redesigning my memory, my unconscious part of my brain, from which I will make 99% of my decisions. And this is why every day you've got to write something positive into that script. 
you've got to keep writing positive scenes and words to the script of your life because that will determine the decisions you're going to make tomorrow. It's going to influence them. Now when you start thinking about this and you start thinking about Lucifer had worshipped God for a trillions and trillions of years and he loved to do it. But he flipped the script. He would have loved Adam and Eve had he known them before he fell. Had he had never fallen, he would have only helped Adam and Eve. But he changed the script of his life. And now he did everything and he's doing everything he can to destroy the human family. That wasn't his original script. He wrote that script. And so when we start looking about, when we look at movements in the end of time, and there's going to be people who are going to pressure lawmakers to pass a Sunday law, and we won't be able to buy and sell, they're doing this out of their memory. They're doing this because they have a story that they've allowed to be written in their mind, and they're just carrying out their script. And until there's some new information, they're going to keep acting that way. Isn't that interesting? And this is why every day becomes new. Every day there can be a new you adding only positivity. And this is why we were reading last week. Only say that which is kind. You ever said anything unkind in your life before? Had that ever been part of your script in the past? But what if that new thought that Sister White was inspired to write, he says, and you think about it. Wow. Always say it in a nice way. Always. I've never really thought about it that way before. But I want to think about it. I want to pray about it. I want to do it. What's happening? It's actually becoming a part of me, isn't it? And the more I think about it, the more it's part of me. The new me. That now will start reacting to people and only say it in a nice way. So every day is an opportunity. Choices make something out of nothing. Do you realize that before I read, every time you say something should be nice or pleasant? That thought didn't, didn't, didn't actually occur to my mind. I didn't have it. But by reading it, and by having a thought about it, something just got created out of nothing. That's powerful. So then when I started thinking about what we read this morning, that we're a counterpart to God. And I'm not, I'm not saying we're creationists, like as we're creators. But in, our, in reality, when you choose to fall in the footsteps of Jesus, you're creating something new every day. You're creating a thought that you didn't have the day before. And that's wonderful. That's how we cooperate with the Creator. There's another word. Do I have time? I'm sorry. I, I'm almost done here. Okay. Creative recapsulization. That's what I saw when I first read it, right? <laughs> Creative recapsulization. So conceptualize. Reconceptualization. Creative Reconceptualization. I probably didn't say it right the first time. And again, this is what I was mostly just talking about. That we're not just adding information. We are redesigning our memories. But what I wanted to share was the woman who... And we could probably talk about almost every story in the Bible like this. The woman who had the issue of blood for how many years? Was it 12? 12 years. 
she had certain concepts. She tried going to the doctor. She spent money over here and over there. But you know, she didn't quite conceptualize that there would be a person that would change her whole life until she heard about Jesus. Now imagine how her thought process, and we're not told how her process, pro, thought process went. <laughs> but I'd imagine it went something like this. For 12 years she tried a lot of different things and there may have been some ideas that nothing's going to work. But she heard about someone whose name is Jesus and there were people who were healed. There was, she heard too many stories that some of it at least had to be true. And now she was able to take something that wasn't even in her mind and it became a thought that became a hope. And because of what she heard about Jesus, and because of her need, she can now reconceptualize something creatively, something that wasn't there before because of this new information. And now she couldn't stop thinking about Jesus. And it didn't matter how big the crowd was. She was going to make her way through the crowd and the crowds around her. And she got to the point where she thought she had so much faith in Him. Because everybody else had let her down. She had no reason to have faith in anybody else anymore. But now she had a, a refound faith. And she even got to the point that she could conceptualize. That if I would even just touch His garment, I would be healed. Now you start thinking about how important thoughts are. It is so essential, friends, that you conceptualize what God can do for you. What He wants to do for you. And you believe it. Because if you don't even think about it, it'll never exist. And every thought becomes an actual physical thing. It becomes a protein in your brain. So I wrote down seven things that I think helps us to have deep learning and fruitfulness. And I'll go quickly through these. Search for truth. You've got to be willing to search for truth. You know, most people are going to be lost because they didn't even search to know what is truth. But you've made up your mind that you want to be blessed by not just adding information, but you're so excited about what you can learn that you're searching for truth because you know it's going to redesign your memories and it's going to give you a whole new world perspective that you will now, day by day, have the perceptions of Jesus if you could just add more of Jesus to your day. Because it's real. It is actually real. I mean, you can prove it scientifically. But you search for it, and in your searching, now you're going to go through the process of actually gathering this information. And you're going to want to gather enough information so that you can be convinced that this very thing is actually true. So the first thing is you're going to commit yourself to search. Number two, you're going to gather information. You're going to gather sufficient information to get to point number three that you can actually have conviction about something. And number four, you're going to have to deal with your desire. Because you may have searched something and found something that goes counter to your behavior or your lifestyle or something, and you're going to have to make a decision. Is the cost too big? Or is it exactly what you need and what you really want? And so you search, you gather, you have conviction, you have a desire, and now you desire, yes, I want to follow. Think of the power of decision, the power of the will. I brought a whole thing of Ellen White quotes, which we won't have time for. The power of the will. Maybe that's what I'll do January first weekend is the power of the will, this, this part of making a decision. Think in terms of the life of Daniel, the power of him choosing to do something he already knew was right. 
how that affected his whole being, his mind. You know, he had the most beautiful mind in Babylon. Isn't that right? And then number four, decision. Now that you've exercised your desire to do what God wants you to do, you decide to actually do it. Because there's a lot of people who have a desire but don't make a decision to do it. So you have a desire to do it, you make a decision to do it, and number six, you figure out how to apply it. Think of the thinking process of searching and digging and adding knowledge and making a decision to do it, and now you're thinking about more deeply how to apply it. Well, now it's really becoming a more part of you, isn't it? Than just reading. And then after you've applied it, and it's been such a blessing to you, what would be part number seven? Sharing it with other people. That's now full circle. That is completely being blessed by taking more time to deeply think about things. And now I want you to think about this verse. James 2.26 Faith without works is dead. Until we put it into practice. Until we make a decision to do it. Until we Till we find a way of applying it, till we wind up then sharing with them. It's just a faith that's died. There's no life in it. Uh, one is to search for truth. Number two, gathering information. Number three, you're convinced of it, conviction. Number four, now you're faced with desire. Now you gotta decide what you're gonna do with this information. Number five, you make a decision to do it. Number six, you figure out now how to apply it. Now that you decided to do it, how am I going to do this? And then having done it, number seven, you want to what? Share it. In the book of James, chapter 3, verse 16, for where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. So, I must have had a thought when I come up with this one. But anyway, I, I think there's a connection here. <laughs> but what I wrote down here anyway is information bombardment versus deep restive thinking. Now, we've heard that people should keep their minds busy. And we praise people for having the ability to multitask. Yet, reports show that simultaneous exposure to electronic media, like you're on Facebook or something, while you're watching something like television, you're multitasking. Probably could have come up with a better example. Appears to be associated with increased depression and anxiety. Dashing back and forth between tasks decreases our attention, making us increasingly less able to focus on our thought habits. This opens us up to shallow and weak judgments and decisions and results in passive mindlessness. Think about the times in which we live. What's the devil doing? Negativity, negative thoughts, right? Toxicity. There's not that much out there healthy to even eat anymore. Negativity, toxicity, and what's everybody doing right now? They're texting in this, right? Just shallow, nit bits, pieces here, bombardment of information. You know what that does? Causes this uh, passive mindlessness. Now I want you to think about where the devil wants everybody to be thinking when he passes a Sunday law. Passive mindlessness. People will just follow, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, this, this I found very interesting when I, when I was looking up the word, them wondered after the beast. I was looking up this last night too, besides the word beguiled. And I just thought, oh, there's got to be something to this word. And you start digging a little deeper and a little deeper. And one of the definitions of they wondered after the beast, the word for wonder, was astonished out of one's senses. And beginning to speculate on the matter. 
Imagine people wondering after the beast because they're only beginning to speculate on the matter. And so they're passively, mindlessly falling. Why are they doing that? Well, in part because of all the negativity in the air today, the toxicity in the food chain, and all this multitasking stuff that keeps people from thinking deeply. The devil's destroying people's minds to actually make a decent decision. I mean, you can see this all playing out, can't you? Which is why God has to have a people who live how? A very simple lifestyle that's healthful, that has time to commune with God. You're not caught up in all the gadgets of the world. What's most important to you is to make sure your affections are set on heaven. Jesus is the center of your life. You have these deep moments of contemplative, restive thinking with Jesus. You're adding to your script all this positivity. And you say, that is way more important to me than being on Facebook all day or Twitter or this or that. Because the devil's going to try to... You know, have you ever tried to do something and you got an interruption and it was very important in your understanding and maybe it's a, a worship time and then you get these interruptions? The devil just doesn't want you to spend time thinking deeply about spiritual things. And you have to guard it. Because it affects your worldview. Well, I'm going to keep it because I know it's late and we'll continue this a little more because it'll fit into maybe talking more about the will next time um, and uh, and I'm not sure what else but anyway I'll text Janet and <laughs> hopefully the sermon title fits my actual talk and uh, but anyway we need to really find time with God before we have our closing prayer we have a, a closing hymn Hymn number 308.
Father, you created us in a perfect way that would allow us to live for eternity. But it was always based upon giving ourselves wholly to Thee. So, Father, now we know that no matter after 6,000 years of sin and all the hereditary traits we've received, we can make the choice to become wholly Thine. And Father, we just welcome and are excited for each opportunity each day that we can add to this script of life all the love and joy that you have to give to us. So, Father, help us to experience this joy more fully, to understand your love in a deeper way as we allow you to transform us into that altogether beautiful life of Jesus Christ. So, Father, thank you for the time we've been able to worship together and open your word. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.